well i guess it's uh, i guess it's 5 p.m anyway or 9 a.m or coming up to the hour uh so we should uh, so we should make a start hopefully everyone can see my uh, can see my screen um, thank you very much for all uh joining us today actually i hadn't realized in uh, in the uk actually that it was a uh, the bank holiday today so if you're from the uk thank you very much for <laughs> thank you very much for coming along uh, so where are we so like i say welcome to the first the first the embedded hours we've set this up running for the next uh for the next few months hopefully once a month the first friday uh, of every month so as we can all get together and talk about uh, talk about embedded systems talk about fpg and honestly it's not really going to be me it's not going to be me talking for most of it most of it's going to be uh, people coming in to share and talk about their projects and then I want to open up the floor to uh, other people as well so as they can talk and they can ask questions and we'll you can raise your hands if you're an attendee and you've got a question that you'd like to discuss and we'll try and we'll try and pull you in or if you can uh, or if you if you can't if you don't have audio for any reason then uh, just pop it in the zoom webinar and we'll start uh, we'll start from there uh, so like I said it's a uh, the objective here really is to uh, is to make us all feel like a community uh, to be able to talk about our projects and and raise any questions that we might have that we want to come up to come up with um, i want us all to kind of be excellent with each other if you steal the word from bill and ted you know so i'd, I'd really like to you know to to be able to share and develop and learn what we all want so you know please be courteous and uh, and polite to all the attendees and especially the panelists who are uh, who are giving up their time to come and talk about to come and talk about their projects so we can uh, we can run through that uh, today we actually have uh, two two really interesting talks uh, one's coming from alex who's going to talk about his uh, open source uh, fpgs and data centers and optical switching and we have one from tom who's done some really interesting uh, sort of hobby work repurposing uh, fpga boards that have made it into the field and a I think it's correct to say that they're sort of scrap and pulling those back in and using those uh, using those for sort of as development as development boards what i thought then is after we after we've had these discussions and they may take 15 20 minutes each uh, i thought then we'd have a kind of an open q a discussion about what anything uh, wants to wants to talk about one of the things i wanted to do actually since this is the first since this is the first session and not everybody might be aware of, uh, of who I am, so I thought I should, uh, I thought I should introduce myself. Uh, so for everybody, you know, I'm, hi, I'm Adam. Uh, and for the last seven years, only feels like 20 years really, I've been writing the uh, MicroZ Chronicles about how to use uh, particularly Xilinx FPGs uh, and particularly the Zinc and the Zinc, Zinc MPSOC. Uh, so I think most people are going to have come across my ramblings at some point in time and it's going to have allowed you to uh, allowed you to sleep. I've recently been doing a lot of projects as well on Hackster, uh, and there's a couple of Hackster courses if you want to learn about how to use the Zinc using sort of the hardware, the software, and the and the Peda Linux uh, flow. And I have to say as well, Steve Liebson's here, so I think he's heard of the, the Microsoft Chronicle. So Steve, uh, you're the guy that started it all, uh, and I can't thank you enough for the opportunities that you've given me. And obviously Rebecca is here as well, who's been who's absolutely amazing. And really wonderful and is also i cannot cannot thank you enough uh, i actually named steve's name uh is what my son one of my son's names is after steve unfortunately becky you're gonna have to wait until we have the next one for uh for the baby named after uh but so hopefully uh we should have a we should have a good session uh, i had planned on this taking about 15 minutes to do an introduction but actually uh like everything in the world i'm uh, it's going slightly faster than that so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Alex, who's going to talk to you about his FPGAs, data centers, and optical switching. I'm just going to give him control of the presentation so as he can uh, move through as he wants. And then I'm going to unmute myself and over to you, Alex, and uh, away you go. All right, great. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. Can everybody hear me? Maybe, yep, okay, all right, perfect. Um, so my name is Alex Berensic, and um, Talk, the title for my talk today is FPGAs, Data Centers, and Optical Switching. Let's see, Let me go to the next slide. Hey, Alex, there's a weird alarm song or, or sound or echo coming through on your side. Uh -oh. 
that's weird. Let's see, does it work if I uh, get rid of the headphones? Nope. Oh, crap. Are you still hearing this, the, the noise? Uh, actually, it's gone. Oh, no, it's back. <laughs> it sounded a bit like a fan, mm. actually. But so, anyway, it seems to have gone now. So go for it. It's it's gone now. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, That's weird. Okay. Um. Now the question is: Is this going to go to the next slide? I don't know if this is if this is going to the next slide here. <laughs> Hello. Okay. All right. Seems to be doing something now. There's quite a bit of delay in the uh, in the video. It seems uh, when I push the key to go to the next slide, it's just like a a second or two of delay. All right. So uh, first, a little bit about myself. I am a postdoc in the Systems and Networking Group at UCSD. I, uh, I've been in the group for quite a few years. I actually joined the group as an undergrad in 2011, and I've been working um, with hardware uh, in the group uh, ever since. So uh, the point of the group is that we build hardware. We don't just do simulations, and we work across basically the entire uh, networking stack. So we have the, uh, a link to the site if you want to take a look. But the, the main focus of the research that we've, that we've been doing over the past few years is uh, looking at optical switching and data center networks with the goal to um, use optical switching to improve the efficiency of uh, data center networks. Okay, so there's a couple things I'm gonna talk about today. First, a little bit of kind of general motivation and background for the research that we're doing at UCSD. And then uh, I'm gonna talk a bit in detail about a couple of the projects that I've been working on over the uh, past couple of years. Okay, so the uh, internet today runs on web applications and cloud services, and the scale of these applications requires them to be run inside of what are called hyperscale data centers. And these data centers contain tens or hundreds of thousands of computers that are interconnected by a high bandwidth network. Uh, and these uh, data centers can provide the scale necessary for these applications that run across millions of uh, devices and uh, you know, millions of users. And the bandwidth requirements inside of these data centers to support these applications have been increasing rapidly. Traditionally, these networks have been built using um, electrical packet switches. And electrical packet switches are great because they work in a distributed fashion and they operate on a packet by packet basis, meaning, making routing decisions as they go. Uh, packet switch bandwidth and link bandwidth, however, are not increasing fast enough to keep up with the uh, demand for data. Uh, one possible solution is to use what's called optical circuit switching. And in this case, we're operating at the level of links instead of packets. So instead of looking at each packet, we're making and breaking physical connections. And uh, if this is done in the optical domain, then it's agnostic to the link rate. You can replace the transceivers and replace the, uh, the NICs and uh, use the switch with faster links without having to replace the switch. Uh, you couldn't even think of doing that with uh, an electrical switch. And um, as a result, there's potential for significant cost and power savings. However, there are challenges, obviously, associated with any change like this. Um, it's a fundamentally different switching paradigm. Uh, it requires different network architectures, time synchronization, transmission control, fast locking receivers, new protocols, all sorts of stuff. You need to do work across the entire stack in order to actually make this work. So at UCSD, we've been working on projects for the past several years to explore different aspects of uh, data center networking and different switching technologies to try and figure out uh, what some of the challenges are in building networks of this type. So the pictures on the slide represent uh, several years worth of, uh, of research. Um, oh, is there still some noise? Well, I don't know if there's much we can do about that. This is, is, is that noise going to be a problem or is it going to be okay? It's survivable. All right. I guess we'll have to, <laughs> all right. I'll have to look into that for uh, next time I give a presentation. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> 
Right, so at UCSD, we build these systems so we can actually um, test um, <coughs> this, this optical switching in a relatively realistic data center environment. So that brings us, that brings me to the first topic that I'm gonna to talk about today, uh, some of the work that I did at the IBM Research as an intern over the past couple of years. Just gonna to go to the next slide. Hello. There we go, um, where we took a couple of experimental devices and integrated them uh, to make a, uh, an experimental optical link. So we took a high-speed silicon punic switch that switches in about five nanoseconds and a burst mode receiver that uh, locks in about 30 nanoseconds or so and uh, put them together. So the main thing that we were looking at with this setup is to try and characterize uh, what we're calling the system level reconfiguration time. And this is how long it takes to change not just the configuration of the switch, but you know the entire network. So it's the switching time, plus the uh, CDR locking time, plus all of the required uh, guard bands and other delays that are necessary for the entire system to operate. Um, so these guard delays could be coming from you know time synchronization that's required to get all the pieces of the network to operate uh, on the on the same time scale. So. The setup that we built, we took a, um, a burst mode receiver chip from IBM and a two by two uh, silicon photonic switch. <coughs> and we connected them to a, uh, a Xilinx Vertex Ultrascale FPGA. So we used the FPGA to, to uh, generate the test data that we sent through the, uh, through the devices, as well as to control the switch and trigger the burst mode receiver and also collect all the data that came out of the burst mode receiver to count up how many errors we received. So that's a block diagram of test setup, and this is what it actually looks like uh, in the lab. So we've got uh, the setup on the lab bench with the FPGA in the corner um, and the QSFP commercial uh, transmitter. The output of that goes up to the switch, which I'll show in a moment. It comes back down to the burst mode receiver, which is in the middle. We take the output of that goes through a couple of level shifters and then to a uh, custom built the multiplexer board, which allows us to bring the output of the uh, CDR chip back into the FPGA. We need to use a demultiplexer board, so um, we're not going through the FPGA serializers, um, which have their own uh, locking time associated with that. So the burst mode chip that we're using here is built in 32 nanometer CMOS. Uh, it's one of the experimental IBM devices. It has a locking time of 31 nanoseconds at 25 gigabits per second, or maybe about 40 or so nanoseconds at uh, 20 gigabits per second. On the other side of the setup, this goes to the next slide. This will show the uh, optical switch uh, under the microscope. There we go. Um, so right here in the middle, we have the uh, optical switch under the microscope, and this is a two by two silicon photonic switch. We use fiber probes to uh, connect the uh, light into and out of the switch chip. Um, so that's hooked up to the FPGA with those uh, blue cables so we can control the switch and set it into uh, the state that we want. And this picture also, also shows some of the uh, optical components, the uh, attenuator and the amplifier, uh, as well as the, uh, some of the power supplies for biasing the, uh, the other components in the test setup. So when we run it and hook it up to the scope, we get uh, traces look like this. And let's see, there we go. Um, <coughs> we're switching in about 60 nanoseconds. And you might remember that this, the lock time of the receiver is about 30 or 40 nanoseconds, depending on the rate that we're running at. So there's uh, some additional time required for some of the other components to operate. And this gets back to the system level switching time that I was talking about earlier, is that it's not just about the switching time of the actual switch, everything that has to take place during a reconfiguration of the switch is, uh, is important for the overall system performance. Uh, let's see here. And then we also ran bit error rate measurements going through the switch just to show that yes, we can get down to 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12 um, <coughs> error rate um, when this thing is running with the switch switching. So these measurements are in some sense idealized because we have the FPGA that's directly connected to all of the components um, in the test setup. We don't have any variance from time synchronization. And um, if you want to take this and run it in a data center environment, you need to do a bit more work. 
I didn't talk about some of these previous projects, but um, a bunch of the other systems that we built at UCSD with you know, microsecond scale switching, we've run into huge issues with trying to transmit uh, data out of the end hosts, um, kind of on the same time scale uh, that the switches are operating at. And um, as we learned from that, it's not really feasible to do that with software or with commercial NICs. We need some other solution. So that brings me to uh, my latest project, which is the uh, Corundum open source FPGA based NIC. <coughs> Assuming this goes to the next slide. Okay, there we go. Um, so the gist of it is that precise control of packet transmission from servers has a bunch of applications, not just for the circuit switching stuff that we've been doing, but you can do rate limiting, flow control, congestion control, uh, things of that nature. Um, like I just mentioned, sub-microsecond control is not really feasible in software because you have interrupts, you have um, you know, task switching, caching effects, all sorts of stuff that um, makes it unreliable. If you're doing stuff at a millisecond time scale, you can get away with it, but if you're doing microsecond, it doesn't work. If you're going faster than that, it definitely doesn't work. Um, in commercial NICs, you don't have very much hardware support for enforcing this type of uh, timing. You have a limited number of uh, queues, and that means you don't have um, very much control over what traffic is arriving at the NIC, and uh, there's also very limited control over transmit scheduling. Maybe they give you some rate limiters if you're lucky, otherwise you, don't, you can't really do much. Uh, commercial smart NICs are another possibility, but those are really designed for uh, line rate packet processing, where you're just gonna change a few header fields or something, or maybe encrypt or decrypt the packet payload data. They're not really designed for flow control, where you're gonna be hanging on packets for an extended period of time. Uh, so they're not really a good option for this. And yes, we have looked into that as well. It doesn't work very well. Um, <clears throat> but we know it's possible to do on an FPGA. Um, but unfortunately, when I started working on this, there were no extensible high-performance uh, reference designs that we could build on top of. So um, this has been a problem. Uh, this has been a thorn on our side for years. And about two years ago, I basically said, screw it. We're going to do this properly and build our own NIC uh, that we can... Uh, attach these features uh, that we need and build on top of. So that was the genesis for the uh, Corundum project. The idea is to build a high performance and reference NIC design that uh, is extensible, that we can um, build this high, uh, high precision transmission control on top of um, to enable the hardware prototyping of experimental networks and protocols. So first I'll discuss some uh, high level features of uh, the Corundum design. Basically, um, right now, we only support the uh, Vertex um, and Kintex uh, Ultrascale and Ultrascale Plus FPGAs because of the, the PCI Express interface. Um, we're going to port it to other devices uh, at some point in the near future. But uh, whatever PCI Express interface is on the FPGA, we can take advantage of. So PCI Gen 3 by 16, that works great. Um, then on the other side, uh, we can have multiple 10G, 25G, or 100G Ethernet ports. Um, and internally, we have a fully custom high-performance DMA engine. And that's really the heart of the NIC. If the DMA engine doesn't do what we need it to do, we're not going to get uh, good performance. Um, and then we also have a Linux driver that connects the design to the standard Linux kernel networking stack. So with this setup, you can run you know, unmodified applications, and everything will basically just, uh, just work, um, as opposed to using something like DBDK, where you might need to Right applications specifically to interface with um, the NIC using that framework. Um, Corundum provides control of data transmission on a very fine-grained per destination basis. We support you know thousands of uh, hardware transmit queues, um, and that means that in software we can uh, classify traffic on a per destination basis and then control it with a hardware scheduler on the NIC. And that enables us to do microsecond precision TDMA, which can interface with the uh, optical switches that, uh, that we're using. And uh, we also have a, um, a phi level measurement capability that's uh, similar to um, what we were doing for the IBM work that I discussed previously. And all this is uh, open source, it's up on GitHub right now. So if you want to take a look at it, uh, you can download it and, uh, and bang on it. Um, <coughs> Let's see, what's my next slide here? Let's go 
go to the next slide. Okay, there we go. So this is a uh, just a high level overview of uh, all of the components that are on the front of NIC. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this, but this shows all the queue management components, um, the transmit and receive data paths, the uh, PCI Express. Uh, interface and DMA components, as well as the uh, transmit and receive or the, the transmit scheduler and scheduler control modules. Okay, so what happens uh, if we actually take this thing and stick it in the server and compare it to uh, an existing commercial link? Well, the performance of uh, Crundum actually stacks up rather nicely to uh, an existing uh, commercial link. We tested it against the Mellanox Connect X5. Um, 100 gig NIC, and we can keep up relatively well <coughs> with uh, 9K MPU packets on the 100 gig link. So in this case, we just use iPerf, which is a standard application for uh, generating uh, traffic. And <coughs> we can keep up very well in with transmit and receive running separately. If we run them at the same time, then there's a little bit of a performance degradation, which Hopefully we can resolve that with some uh, optimizing. I think most of that is coming from, uh, from memory, memory management to the driver. If we drop the packet size down a bit, we can uh, to kind of a more standard MTU size for uh, 1.5 kilobytes. Uh, we don't keep up quite as well, but uh, we do hold our own against the, uh, uh, the Millinox NIC. Let's see. So, the other thing that we tested as well is the uh, ability to control the traffic on fine time scales. And kind of the whole reason for building this NIC is a TDMA performance. And with a 100 microsecond period, um, we need a guard time of about two microseconds or so, which is about three packet lengths. So that's pretty good. And what I have here on the left is the uh, switch that we've connected this to. Uh, down at the bottom, we've got uh, the server rack, which has um, you know, nine servers in it with the FPGAs installed, and then that's connected to this diffraction gradient-based switch. I have a picture of the switch disk uh, on the top. So that's used to actually uh, reconfigure the connections between the servers. And with this setup, with uh, a relatively old version of, uh, of the Crundum driver, we were able to run at about three gigabits per second on a 10 gig link with the low packet loss. Uh, with the, the latest design and the latest driver, we should be able to do better than that, but the switch is currently in pieces, so uh, we won't be able to test that until we put everything back together, which probably won't be for a while. Um, <clears throat> let's see. What was my next slide here? This multiple second delay is slightly annoying. Okay, so the other thing that we can do on this, like I said, is um, we can perform these high resolution uh, bit error rate measurements um, in the NIC design. And this allows us to characterize all the optical paths through the, uh, the switch that we're using. So with this setup, we can synchronize all the NICs and the switch with PTP and uh, perform error measurements uh, through the switch to figure out if there are any um, internal uh, defects. And from that, we can optimize the design of the, of the switch. OK, so let's see. I think my next slide is a summary slide. So yeah, we, uh, we put the NIC together. Everything works. We can saturate uh, 10 and 25G links. We can hit about 94 gigabits per second on a uh, 100G link. And uh, the near-term objectives are going to be to um, do some additional optimization for uh, small packet sizes to improve the performance and to improve the TDMA performance and to uh, develop and validate some of the hardware networking protocols that, that we're interested in at UCSD, and also write a DPDK driver, hopefully. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening to, uh, to my talk. And I have here a couple of pictures of uh, a couple of different debug setups that uh, I've used. The, the first one here is um, a uh, test setup with a PCIe protocol analyzer for debugging some of the uh, PCI Express um, oddities. And then on the other side, I have a test setup that I put together. Oops, put an extra slide somehow. Okay, this, this is a test setup that I put together for um, the first time we sent a packet through the Linux kernel networking stack. Held the whole setup uh, back to my uh, parents' house over winter break and uh, borrowed a couple other computers we had in the house to. Uh, to make it work.
All right. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you going straight to Adam or straight to Tom. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. It was really that was really interesting. Uh, I, I presume did you include a link or shall we put that in the um, or should we put that in the thing you sent out? Is there's a link to your GitHub where you can download this? I think the conundrum. Yeah, there's a link. Um, if uh, if you want to add another link, I mean, I'm not going to argue with that. You know, no, no, we'll provide the link. We do have some questions. I, I noticed in the chat going up. I wasn't I wasn't talking in the chat because I didn't want to uh, didn't want to make the delay any any longer than what was kind of happening over the uh, over advancing the right. slide. But I noticed that Brendan actually asked a couple of questions uh, about. I don't know if he's still online. Uh, yeah, so Brendan was asking about if you could if you decoded the destination address optically and he was talking about the with the time switch of being five nanoseconds uh, he thought that was a long oh, time okay so so how do you uh, so do you have long medium and slow, do you have slow medium and long packets or something like that can you, can you expand on that area um right for the uh, for the nanosecond scale switching um for that well so the whole point of all of the optical switching is that we don't look at the packet data at all as it passes through the switch. We just make and break the connections and then the packets will flow when the uh, connections are formed. So uh, let me see if I can look at the actual question here. Um, all right, I guess that's a different question. <laughs> um, yeah, so in terms of, so with, with the IBM switch setup that's operating more on the scale of individual packets so if you're going to use a system like a switch of that speed in a system you would probably have to have some sort of um out of band communication to determine you know how long the switch is going to sit in a particular uh, configuration or you'll have to use something like cell switching where all of the blocks that are sent through the switch are the same size um because as i said the whole point of this uh, type of switching is that we're not looking at what's going down the wire at the switch. The switch is set totally independent of that. For the other switches, we're operating more on a microsecond time scale, so we're going to be sending, you know, multiple packets back to back to try and fill up uh, the time slots through the switch. Okay, that's that's perfect. There was another question just popped in the um, in the question and answers channel. Uh, so someone was just asking how you could compare your open source SmartNIC if you'd looked at that with a how it compares with a new Xilinx SmartNIC that's been uh, being released. If you've done any baseline tests or anything comparisons of that, or is that in the future to to come? Well, so the new Xilinx SmartNIC we're talking about the um, the solar flare one yes, basically, yeah, where it's the combination of the NIC ASIC. Right. Yeah. So there's actually a couple of different uh, SmartNICs that involve FPGAs that we've looked at. I have not looked very, uh, very closely at the solar flare based one, but I did take a look at the uh, Mellanox Innova Flex NIC. And basically the situation for most of these uh, smart NICs is the same because all of these are designed for um, offloading a small amount of uh, kind of bump in the wire type processing to the NIC. So it's designed for you know, receiving a packet from the host or from the wire, performing some very basic computation or possibly a bit more involved and then turning it around very quickly and either sending it back out on the wire or passing it to the host. Um, so with the, uh, with the Xilinx based NIC that they just released um, that uses the uh, solar flare ASIC, um, basically, there's an FPGA on there, and there's the Solar Flare ASIC, and the Solar Flare ASIC is in charge of all of the transmitting and receiving uh, with the host network stack, and then data gets passed through the FPGA before uh, going onto the wire. Okay. Um, so with that setup, you basically don't have any control over, uh, or you have very limited control over packet transmission uh, over the bus, and that's kind of the whole goal of Corundum is to get control over that. And one thing you could think of uh, Quantum is providing is just a very high performance kind of packet DMA engine where you can provide a uh, custom transmit scheduler. If you don't need the transmit scheduling feature, then I mean, Quantum might not really be uh, the tool for your project necessarily. If you want to do some very fancy packet processing, well, you can stick that, um, you can use Quantum and then put your packet processing on the FPGA uh, after the uh, kind of DMA interface side of it. 
because that just comes out as AXI stream. So you can put yeah. that so you can, you can add, you can add my, the sound. Right. In fact, one of my research colleagues has been building a uh, system that puts uh, 16 RISC-V cores on an FPGA. Um, so we have Crundum on there, and then we have 16 RISC-V cores that can do packet processing on incoming and outgoing packets. So, so we have to get your so we have to get your colleague to come on and talk about this on one of the next on one of the future uh, future embedded hours then, uh, and he can he can come and tie it into tie it into this. Yeah, I, 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 think, I can ask him. We'll see. Yeah, please do. Please please ask him. We, we we want people to come and talk and share their share their projects. So thank you very much for sharing that. I'm sure some people are going to reach out to you and ask you some email and ask you some questions over email as they. Uh, as they think about it as the day goes on. Uh, so we have the, the next uh, talk we have actually is from uh, Tom Vergra. Did I say your surname correctly there? I'm terrible with uh, terrible with pronunciations. Of no, you, you, you did not, but, but even my wife can't say it correctly. So don't ah, worry. Well, that's, that, that's, that's good then. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand this over to you. I'll give you the, con I'll give you the control and uh, feel free to take it away. If you get close to sort of, uh, 20 minutes or so I'll give you a little prod that we uh, that we might be running out of time uh, okay but, uh, there you go you should have you should have control so okay way to go, sir. okay good uh, good morning everybody uh, my name is Tom Verbeure uh, I design ASICs and FPGAs at NVIDIA during the day and I play with FPGAs in the evening in my garage and that's where I am right now um, so basically I'm, I'm going to talk here if the slides move so uh, maybe I have to click on them yeah that's true that I can let's try it. I think you have to accept control as well. Maybe. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So um so my hobby is um, to reverse engineer um commercial products that happen to um be FPGA based and then convert them into um FPGA development kits. And and there are different reasons why I like to do that. Um first is price. Um you, you basically have a double price effect. Uh, companies can get a much bigger better deal on FPGA pricing due to high volumes. And then also commercial products um, often become obsolete and then they end up very cheaply on eBay. Um, so, um, and then the, the FPJ capacity of these products is often much higher than what you can find in a commercial development kits or, or hobby development kits. Um, I think the best example of this is, for example, is the Panologic G2, uh, which has 150,000 uh, logic elements um, in a Spartan 6 LX150. Um, and I bought uh, um, 25 of those for $75 um, on eBay. Um, now, th after I published about this, they became more popular. And now, th now the price is about $20 a piece, but that's still an incredibly low price for um, a huge uh, capacity FPGA. Uh, and another thing is specialty features. Um, if, you're, if you're lucky and you can reuse these boards uh, for an application that's closely related to um, what was uh, originally intended, then um, you know you, you you have everything uh, right there, um, and then the, the satisfaction of hacking. I mean, that there is just something really fun about using a board for something that it was not intended to intended to do. And then there's of, of course cons. I mean, you, you may require ugly hacks. I mean, going back to this Panologic board, um, you know, it doesn't have GPIOs, and if you want to have let's say a, a serial um, a, a UART uh, console on there, um, I mean, you need to to do hacks such as using an LED. Um, I/O as as, a, as your uh, serial port, or or what people do now is they use the um, the HDMI I square C port for that, um, and then um, yeah. So basically, the, the reverse engineering itself can be quite tedious, but it can also be very rewarding um, after the hours of measuring signals suddenly to to, to get a blinky. Um, and of course, there's little or no su support online, so um, you're basically on your own. And um, yeah. Um, so here are a few examples of it. Um, let's wait again for the two seconds. There we go. So here are a few, few of those example boards. Um, I already mentioned the Panologic um, G1 and G2. Um, I spend most of time on, uh, a lot of time on, on, on those. They're these really cute boxes. Um, and they were the thin client um, boxes. They were supposed to uh, replace PCs as uh, terminals. Um, it didn't really go well. Um, but they have all the interfaces that you require if you want to build your own little computer. Um, you know, video interfaces, uh, USB, DVI, uh, Ethernet, uh, it has DRAM. And they're also great because they have um, a very easily accessible JTAG port. And that's always uh, very important if you want to, to work on these kind of boards. Otherwise, nobody's going to use them. Um, and so, yeah, right now they're available for roughly uh, $20 on eBay. Uh, another one that has... Um, um, oh, and by the way, these Panologic boards, and just a few days ago, somebody was able to port 
uh, Linux to these boxes. So you have um, uh, an, um, you know, a small SLC, RISC V based, and then they ported uh, Linux to it, and that's currently working. Um, the Panologic G1 is smaller, um, and, but that one has been used already. I, for example, I've, um, I've run Pac-Man on it. Um, somebody has um, ported some uh, Nintendo uh, emulator to it. So it's, it's, it's really fun. And then the Color Light 5A75B is a commercial um, LED uh, matrix controller. And you can buy them today for $15 on, um, on AliExpress. So they're really totally available commercially right now. They have a pretty large um, lattice uh, ECP5 FPGA. And so they're an excellent choice if you want to use an FPGA that's supported by uh, open source tools. So open source tools such as Yosis and uh, Next PNR. Um, they have um, a, a number of interesting features. One of the problems with them is that while they have tons of IOs, they're all outputs. So if you really want to use them for a general purpose, uh, inputs and outputs, you would have to start desoldering some chips. Um, and that's, uh, that's a little bit of a hassle. Um, with all these projects, I'll provide the, the, the GitHub repos and uh, you, you can ask me or uh, there's other people who are, um, who are fairly active on these, on these projects who, who can um, you know, answer your questions. Uh, here's another example that I worked on. Uh, wait. Okay, so um, the, co the EE Color Color 3 was a, an HDMI uh, image enhancer. I don't know exactly what it did, but it was definitely a commercial flop. Um, and around 2012, I believe, um, it was offered at some point for $20 with a $20 rebate. So it was essentially free. Um, but then somebody discovered that you could use um, those FPGAs um, for Bitcoin mining. And then people started buying them massively just, you know, as Bitcoin miners back in the day when they were still profitable and prices went back up. Uh, today, they're still available on Amazon, um, but um, from, I think, supplies are starting to run out. In any case, if you want to do something with HDMI in and HDMI out, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting board and, and I've done exactly that. I've been able to, to create a project where I do um, you know, a, a, green, a, a green screen and, and overlay uh, with, with, with other stuff. And then the, the RV901T is a Spartan 6 board. Uh, it's the, 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 an older version of the color light. It's not that interesting anymore because here's an example um, of a board that requires lots of surgery to just get the JDAG port working and, and that's really not very, I mean, it becomes very fragile. Um, if you want, I, I provide a link. There is a FPGA board hack. You see somebody who uh, maintains uh, an inventory or a, a list of all these kind of um, um, commercial products with FPGAs that you could use to, to reverse engineer. Okay, so now uh, Cisco. So Cisco uses a lot of FPGAs. Uh, their products are expensive and they love be, uh, being able to make um, uh, bug fixes through um, their um, internet operating system updates. I think that's iOS, anyway. Um, you can find uh, many router plugin cards uh, on eBay. Um, however, a lot of those are using uh, small and obsolete FPGAs or CPLDs. So it, it takes a while to find um, something that's, that's kind of interesting. And, and one way I did it is by just looking very closely to the, the pictures of those boards as they're posted on eBay and trying to figure out what kind of FPGA is on there. And, and here you see a list of, of FPGA boards that are uh, quite interesting. I started with uh, the VWIC um, boards. Um, um, I mean, they're, they're, they're very cheap, they have a Stratix FPGA, um, but they basically became, um, it turns out they were not very useful because um, getting a JTAG on there was, was an incredible pain and very, very fragile. Um, so eventually I, ended, I, I started working on the HWIC 3G CDMA um, because it has a, a combination of, of um, free tools, well, free as in beer tools, um, it has a lot of interesting features and it has a JTAG that's very easy to add it. Uh, you, you just need to solder a connector on top of it. You see also the, the, the fourth board. Um, I haven't worked on that one yet, but it's uh, an evolution of the previous one. And one of the benefits, it has a, an on-chip uh, SRAM instead of a DDR2. And those are much easier to use as a hobbyist. Okay, next slide. Um, so um, the CDMA network in the US has been shut down completely um, as of January. And so these boards are now dirt cheap. They used to cost $300. Now you can get them for $8 on eBay. I don't even know why people are still willing to pay for it. I don't think anybody really does. Um, these boards cannot be found in Europe, but there you can find the GSM version uh, for very similar prices. And I didn't buy one of those, but their functionality and the, the PCB should be identical because the PCB I have here um, is basically populated with chips that are the necessary um, I mean, it's, sorry, has uh, uh, footprints for chips that would be used, uh, would be necessary if you want to use the GSM version. Um, 
You can see here a bunch of connectors. The most important one for us is uh, the diagnostic sports. This is a standard uh, Cisco diagnostic sports. It's not Ethernet, unfortunately, uh, but it's an RS-232. Um, and they're great if you want to uh, run a little risk processor on your uh, FPGA and want to, uh, you, you know, you want to have a console and, and print out uh, debug messages and stuff like that. The CDMA, um, you know, B and C connectors are useless, but there are LEDs, and so that's essential to get your uh, FPGA Blinky to work. Um, and then we have been, um, so basically the, the, the board itself, it's almost all, um, okay, the slides are not moving again. Oh, there we go. So um, the, the, the board itself is essentially um, all of the shelf, pa shelf parts. Um, you have a uh, Sierra wireless uh, CDMA um, data modem. And then all the other comp components are basically glue logic to connect it to the HWIC connector. Um, and then with that, you can plug into a regular uh, Cisco LAN router and add uh, one uh, capabilities to your uh, network. Um, so you can see also there a PCI Express mini card. Um, uh, that one has uh, the, the PCI Express mini usually has PCIe and USB. Uh, this one only has USB because that's what the modem card needs. And so you can see on the left bottom, you can see a uh, chip um, that is um, a PCI, old school PCI to a USB host chip. Um, now, one thing you could do, you could remove the modem card and then plug in a converter board that converts PCI to a USB type A connector and then basically have uh, USB support. However, that would require a, a, a lot of work because you would first get the PCI, PCI to work, then you would need to have a USB stack. So I, I doubt anybody will do this, but the possibility is definitely there if you're ambitious enough. Okay, so now let's look at um, all the, um, uh, have a closer look at the, the PCB. Um, all the connections between all the chips have been traced. And so the main things are um, an Altera FPGA Cyclone 2, EP2C35. Then you have the PCI USB chip. Um, then you have a bunch of um, voltage uh, regulators. And then very important on top left, you see uh, the detail of the USB JDAG, uh, JDAG uh, uh, pinout. So that's very useful. Uh, there is a 25 megahertz crystal on there. Okay, next one. Uh, Okay, so on the back of the, P the PCB, we see a, uh, the, the DDR2 chip. Um, and then we also see the RS-232 uh, transceivers. So it requires a, it's a 12 volt RS-232. It's not your regular uh, digital uh, thing. And then at the bottom left, you see uh, the footprint for a, it, there it says NAND flash, that's wrong, it's a NOR flash. Um, so if you really want to, you can solder, I did it. Uh, you, you can solder a NOR flash on there and then connect it to the FPGA and have some additional um, on board the uh, uh, storage. So in the next slide, you'll see uh, the, 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 the details. Um, see, the FPGA is pretty large, right? You have 32K uh, logic elements. Um, that's uh, definitely much more than, than most other very cheap uh, boards you can, you can buy. You have quite a bit of block RAM, which I really like. Um, and then, you know, PLLs, hardware multipliers. Um, and then I already went through the list. So, rest, so let's go through the, through the next slide. Here you see the, the block diagram of the, the thing. It's all very straightforward, you know, from the connector, glue logic, all the way to the, um, to the, the thing. An interesting part of the bottom left is the, the crypto chip. That took me a while to figure out what it does. So all these parts that you see here are um, off the shelf components. And so Cisco used to have a huge issue with um, um, people basically cloning them boards and selling them for cheap. I mean, all these components are cheap and the board was sold for hundreds of dollars. And so there is a crypto chip on there that basically allows Cisco to authenticate to the board against um, their router, and it refuses to work if that authentication chip is not there. It's not something we can use for our purposes. Okay, so then the next, so if, if you want to, if you're a beginner and you want to start completely from scratch with FPGAs, um, I basically uh, costed out what it would take to, um, you know, to, to, to get started with that. And, and I think it compares very favorably uh, compared to um, to any other uh, things, and again, this so Adam, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, so so the main board is uh, is eight dollars on eBay, and then all the other cost is uh, basically related to JTAG. You need to get that connector there, so you need um, a USB bl uh, blaster, um, you know, uh, dongle. I'll talk a bit about uh, that later. Eight dollars, uh, soldering iron, then solder, uh, some connectors, uh, and then. You need to remove the, the solder uh, pads, um, you know, in order to get the connector in there. So you need needles for that. 
So in total, you're looking at $25. And for that, you get a very powerful, I think, FPGA board. And then you need to also power, which is either $5 or $60. Next slide for that. And then nice to have is a, um, actually, can you go back one more? <laughs> yeah. And then uh, next you have the, um, uh, a nice to have the USB to RS232 console. It's a cable you can buy on, um, also on AliExpress. That way you can, you know, send debug uh, things. Next slide. Okay, so uh, the HWIC connector has um, 12 uh, volt, 5 volt, and 3.3 volt um, power rails. Um, but luckily, the 3.3 volt is sufficient to get, it, to get everything wor uh, working, and you just don't connect the other ones. Now, the best generic solution is a, a bench power supply, and if you're interested in hobby electronics, I mean, eventually, you'll probably need one anyway. Um, but the cheap solution is um, an LM2596 or any, anything other, really, uh, DC, D, uh, DC to DC converter and then you can get a 3.3 volt um, out of there. They exist with and without a voltage display. Next slide. Um, so a, a, a quick note about USB blaster clones. So uh, you can find for $2 these USB blaster clones on AliExpress and they're absolutely horrible. Um, I've tried them with multiple boards and they basically don't work um, half the time or, or more than half the time. They're based on a, a PIC32 or an STM32 STM, uh, chip. Um, they're basically cheap and that's all you can say about them. Uh, much better are the, the ones that are uh, based on um, an FTDI, FT245, and a CPLD. Those are actually real clones of what um, Intel is doing. And um, they're, but they're more expensive. They're $8, and I, I, I suggest that you buy those and don't bother with the, with the real cheap ones. Um, these are, of course, I mean, they work with all the Altera tools, but if you use OpenOCD, I've used them also to load bit streams into the Spartan 6s. Um, and they can also be used for your Lattes FPGA. So th th this, is, this is a good purchase, uh, no matter what. I mean, they're not going to be working with the native designing tools. Um, so if you're really interested in, in, in designing FPGAs, you, you, you have similar boards like that, um, also on AliExpress or from Xilinx too, of course. Um, next slide. Uh, then for the development tools, um, you know, Unity PC and Quartus 13.0 uh, SP1 web, web version. It's the, the free as in B version. Uh, it's the last version that supports the Cyclone 2. Um, now, uh, one of the good things about Quartus, in my opinion, is that the functionality really hasn't changed over the years. If you use Quartus 19, uh, so the, the, the current version, uh, you will find yourself right at home in Quartus 13. It's, it's an identical GUI and very little additional functionality. Um, now, the, the, the Quartus editor, I mean, a, a common complaint about all these, these uh, the designings and the, Quart and the, the Altera tools is that they're terrible environments and they're not great. Um, but instead of, you, I mean, just don't use the Quartus editor, use VI, you know, that's, that's the, the best solution always. And then personally, I typically bypass the GUI and I script most of these things with, um, you know, uh, to, to, to do this, the place and route and the synthesis. Uh, like that, it, I, I find it much, much quicker. So you, you don't even need to use the, the GUI if you, if you don't want to. Next slide. Okay, so uh, there's a, a lot of these uh, current FPGA products are for hobbyists are uh, centered around the, the lattice uh, tools. And they work very well. And I really like Yosis and XPNR. Um, they're very fast. The, the, the quality of routing is pretty good these days. But uh, a major advantage, a disadvantage that I find is that um, these open source tools don't have an easily integrated um, on-chip logic analyzer. And, and for me, I see personally that whenever I start a hobby project, um, I will always go back to Intel or, um, or uh, Xilinx uh, just because of the, the availability of skip, uh, chip scope or a signal tap. You can see there a, a screenshot of it. Um, of course, you need, you need to simulate your designs. Um, but, you know, um, an on-chip on uh, analyzer is, is always a good idea. Um, you know, for the cases where you are lazy or where you want, where you don't have simulation models for some um, FPGA specific components. Next slide. So okay, just to, so just to keep you on top, Tom, we have a, we have about five minutes, a couple of minutes left. If you want to get some questions in at the end, so if you can just okay, I'm 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 almost done. Yeah, yeah. So one more thing. So well, so uh, very important. So since GPIOs are so important, the HV connector is not. Um, is, is, is very proprietary from Cisco. So I had to design a small adapter board to convert from this, that custom connector into a GPIO. And you can see that here. Uh, if you want one of those PCBs, I can send you one. I, I, have, I ordered 20 of them. Um, they're, they're not perfect, um, but, um, and, and I, I, I'm pro probably gonna do another spin, um, but they, they, they're good enough to, to, to get going. Uh, next slide. Um, and there's still a, a lot of um, stuff to do on this project. Um, 
So one of the biggest issues about the Cisco boards is they're not self-hosting. They don't have an SPI flash for the bitstream. Um, so you always need your JTAG connector to do that. Now what you can do, and that's what I added to this adapter board, is add some kind of little CPU or microcontroller to load the bitstream in there, and that, that's still a work in process. Um, and then I need to bring all the other chips on, on that board. I haven't done that yet. Um, the the, the, the NordFlash and the DDR are, are most interesting there. Okay, next slide. Uh, and then I, just to show, show that it can be done, I, I, uh, I did an example project where I created an LED cube that runs off this Cisco board. Um, you can see the, 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 the things here. Um, it's not very I mean, important. Next slide. What's more important is the result. So here you see the cube, and on the right you see the board and the adapter board at the bottom um, that drives a Hub75 uh, interface um, to control the, the LED things. So uh, the, the, the thing really works. Uh, next slide. Here's a quick thing. You can see that it is actually possible to retrofit the FPGA with a, with a self-hosting thing. I don't advise it. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> and then here is more information. Um, you know, the, um, yeah, you, you can click on the links. Uh, my blog has a lot of this kind of project on there. Um, feel free to contact me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I would be very uh, happy to, to help people out if, if they want to, to help with us um, as well. And that's it. And let's see what kind of questions we currently have. Ah, perfect. So we have a lot of we have a lot of questions. And for the next webinar, I'm going to work out how to actually ask pe how to actually promote people so that they can actually ask questions in voice. Uh, but since we're a little tight on time, there's a there's a couple of questions in here from a, a chap called Matt Davids. Has asked if you've seen anything with uh, the RF SOC or generally were there any high speed ADCs uh, on board? Any any sort of recommendations of boards that might be uh, that you've come across that could be salvaged and used in that manner? Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't seen anything like that. Um, yeah, m most. I mean, the, I'm, I'm the, the most complex one that I've worked on is one that uh, that's um, that has a, a PCIe interface, um, and that one is still a very much a work in process. Um, it's a, it's a board that used to be a data center um, GZIP accelerator, um, and there there are no PCI no very cheap PCIe boards available. So it would be great if I could get that one working, but it's it's very hard. So um, I, I have a blinky, but that's about it. <laughs> ah, okay, that's cool. Yeah. So we have two two people actually, Carl and Elias, have asked the same question about how do you actually go about deciphering this FPJ, the, the pin out, the hardware? What's what's your sort of uh, approach to actually working out what you've got, yeah. what's connected where? And so so that there are there are two ways of doing. I mean, the, the, the two main ways. One is I buy multiple of them, so I desolder uh, the FPGA and all the chips, and then I start ohming them out. Um, it's a it's a bit of a destructive way, but since these boards are so cheap anyway, it doesn't really matter that much. Now there is another guy called uh, Claude Schwartz. Uh, he's pretty active on Twitter in in reverse engineering things, and he has a very interesting way. He loads um, a design on the FPGA with as many um, UARTs as there are um, IO pins. And on each um, UART, he sends out um, a unique number. And then with his scope, he, he probes the points and he can, he, his scope has a, a UART decoder and he can see right away which pin is driving uh, what. Um, that doesn't always work when you have uh, boards that have multiple chips that, um, where, you have in, where you have inputs instead of outputs. I mean, you can get short, short, short circuits and stuff. Um, but it's, it's a very efficient way to, to quickly figure out a lot of these, uh, a lot of these things. So that it's a, it's a very a very interesting yeah very very interesting approach. That's really cool. I like I like that idea. That's yes. Really, yeah. Uh, yeah. That is really quite something. The the, the UR. like you said, there's a little risk there that you're going to short something out, but I think that's really uh, really quite yeah. cool. Uh, so uh, Olaf yeah. asked, what is your what is your starting point for for getting hands on with a with a new board? Do you do you start with the how do you start with the pinout, the power rails, the um, the architecture or yeah I, I started well the power is the, the first step right so so figuring out exactly what what power to use um, in in this particular case for the Cisco board um, I bought a ten thousand uh, dollar Cisco router that's now available for sixty dollars on eBay um, <laughs> and so um, uh, and then I basically was able to to ohm out uh, I mean I plugged in the board and then I could see which power rails were were what um, and then it, um, figuring out the power architecture is much harder than figuring out the digital stuff because you don't have point-to-point -point connections. You often have caps, resistors, whatever, and they don't they don't uh, ohm out well on an FPGA. I mean, on a with a, with a multimeter. So um, 
so yeah, it's it's a, it's a lot of it's a struggle, um, okay. but eventually that's, you get. It. <laughs> so that's interesting. So Brent, I'll wrap, got one last question, then an interesting question that I'm going to ask after this. So Brendan's just asked, uh, in addition to the networking task, if there's a great effort to promote the use of FPGAs and data centers for actual compute tasks, have you found any uh, large FPGA-based accelerator boards that are appearing on eBay? So any sort of PCIe boards that are appearing on eBay that might be of interest to people? Um, yes, um, there is one board. Um, well, I'm not sure if it's PCIe, but um, one, one very interesting board is um, there is the Catapult project from Microsoft. And they have, um, they use um, um, huge FPGAs for deep learning purposes. And um, they are now going to next generation and these boards are now on eBay very cheap. Um, the problem with those things is that you need commercial licenses for um, the, the development tools from Xilinx and Intel. And so, uh -huh. I, and that's, that's, that's actually, I forgot to mention that that's one of, it's a major criteria in designing, deciding, deciding which FPGA to use. Um, I don't want to use something where you need a $5,000 license. So, um, no. so yeah. So yeah, I, I, think that make, I think that makes perfect sense. So I'm just yes. going to begin to wrap this up because I'm not sure if the Zoom light, light thing actually ends at uh, ends on the dot of six, whether we if we run over or not. Uh, I just want to say actually, what we I hope I hope you've really enjoyed today. I found it really interesting. Alex and Tom's talk have been have been really really wonderful. Uh, obviously, we'd like to do this again, and we'd like to make this a regular. We'd like to make this a regular thing. So I've, we've scheduled the next one for the eighth of May. Hopefully, if you've already signed up, then you you already. Uh, you already signed up for this one. And we're going to have uh, Carhill is going to be speaking on pink. And we have another gentleman who's going to be talking about a, a hardware board and an ecosystem he's designed uh, based around processors um, and software. And if you want to talk, then please, please do sort of uh, send an email to embedded hour at UVO Engineering and we'll, uh, I'll get back in touch with you and we'll, we'll work out a slot for you. We've actually got quite a few people. I've been quite, quite amazed by the uh, response. So we've had got a lot of people that want to come and talk. And want to share their share their stories over the uh, over the next few months. So hopefully, uh, it'll be it'll be really good. Uh, we've got a. So I think yeah, I think that's probably a good place to a good place to wrap up. Alex, Tom. Well, we have one quick question um, that came through to ask all the presenters: Xilinx versus Altera. What's your preferred platform? Really quickly. So, one okay. <laughs> okay, so I'll as well. I'm not. I'll answer that tactically. Uh, so with me, it's obviously it's Xilinx is the main thing that I'm that I'm known for. Uh, but actually, it's it's about choosing the right. We're engineers. It's about choosing the right tool for the right job. Uh, so you'd be surprised that I do design circuits that use micro semi and Intel FPGAs just as well. Uh, I just perhaps don't write about it as much. I, Alex, I Tom, do you have any recommendations for for a hobby? I use interchangeably Xilinx FPG, uh, Xilinx Intel and Lattice. Um, I, I don't have a very strong pr uh, preference. Um, professionally, I use uh, uh, Altera for some very specific reasons, but I don't want to go into that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, even there, I mean, we, we've, we've used them interchangeably as well. And, you know, they, they both have tools that, are, that aren't too great, um, tools that, that often crash, especially when you go to high capacity. Um, but eventually, they get the work done and we can't live without them. So, <laughs> What about you, Alex? Yeah, so I I use both. Um, I probably have a lot more Xilinx hardware than I do uh, Altera hardware, so I get more mileage out of the Xilinx stuff. For the Corundum NIC, I'm actually planning on porting that to running on the Altera devices as well. As of right now, it only supports the Xilinx Ultrascale uh, PCI Express interface because they have a slightly different way of doing that uh, that's not compatible with anything else. Um, Everybody else seems to use a slightly different one. So, and I'm also probably more familiar with the Xilinx tools at the moment, but uh, I've definitely worked with Altera before and I can definitely get up to speed with the Intel slash Altera okay. offerings if, uh, if the need arises. So. And I'm not allowed to answer the question because as Dan points out, it's a loaded question for me because I work for Xilinx. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have some other questions. I think what we're going to do is um, try to answer them offline, maybe in the follow-up email when we send out the slides. Okay, so sorry for everyone. Next time, we'll try to leave more time so that Adam can take just general questions from the community. We will, but thank you very much all for all for coming. We'll, I'll edit this and we'll try and remove the little bit of fan noise that was there. And, uh, I'll, I'll, and we'll, we'll share around the links. We'll share the, we'll share the slides around. 
Uh, and I'm sure if Alex and Tom will not mind you reaching out to them and asking them questions, or myself, if you've got any questions for, for anything I'm doing, then please reach out to us and uh, we can, we'll, we'll get back to you with answers and questions. But uh, thank you very much for coming and, and talking to us all. And we'll, we'll see you on the, uh, on the, 8th, of, on the 8th of May with, uh, with a great talk on Pink and this new hardware framework and, that we're going to be talking about. So until then, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.